We are very excited to welcome Dan Garner to the podcast today. Dan has quickly become one of the go-to experts in the human performance industry. His detailed inside-out approach and science-backed programming have quickly pushed him to the forefront of his industry. With his extensive work as a world-class performance lab analyst, Dan continues to push the industry forward with his publications, research, and no-nonsense approach to education and training. Professionally, Dan has over 20 of the top certifications in both training and nutrition, as well as a formal education in functional medicine and health science. Dan is the co-founder of Biomolecular Athlete, helping individuals reach their full potential through research, science, and education, and the co-owner of Rapid Health Optimization, specializing in athletic performance and physique transformation. His list of clientele include a long list of USC, MLB, NHL, NFL, PGA, Olympians, and Hollywood actors. And let me just start by saying that if you are even slightly interested in what's going on under the hood of your body. Specifically, you mean your blood. Your blood. Um, this podcast is super interesting. Yeah, you and I have talked about many times how, you know, it's difficult to see the inputs and outputs of our behavior, the, the, what is the sort of results of our nutrition, of our stress, and the blood tells no lies. Yeah, I mean, how do you know that the cool new nutrition strategy you're doing or training program because or bro, I feel good sleep strategy and it's or confirmation whatever. bias. Right. right. And, but it turns out that you can actually measure yeah. these things and the blood is, is really the ultimate way to do that. And we've, we've come up with these really sophisticated ways to collect a massive amount of collect and importantly, interpret a massive amount of these biomarkers now. I can't wait till the next generation of wearables start sampling your blood in the real time. <laughs> Just right? like little Kelly, bricks all the too time. Too many cookies. Yeah. I think, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about Dan is sort of that he is simultaneously very interested in moving actionable behavior around blood markers into the field of performance, not just health and through your physician, that there's a lot of things that you can understand without having to use a physician. It's the same way we look at range of motion. And second, it should be noted that he is a user. He is working with high performance athletes under high stress situations where their livelihoods and bodies are on the line. So it's not, he's not just a dilettante. Yeah. And I think he said it super artfully in the podcast, but he's like, Hey, I'm actually doing these things and working with actual yeah. athletes and actual clients. And I'm, you know, proving to myself that these things are working. You know, he's not just talking about these things, you know, in the abstract. And I think there's just a ton to learn from this podcast. Yeah, and yeah. In fact, I think we're probably going to have to have him back for a second episode because we really only were able to touch the surface. Unequivocally, look, this is a great primer to start thinking about why you should be testing, when you should be testing, and how to begin to think and organize. Not individual biomarkers, we didn't just go through the list, but there's so much to be learned here about owning and understanding your health and performance. I hope you all enjoy this awesome episode with Dan Garner. What's up, Dan? Welcome to the Ready State Podcast. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited to talk shop. We are very excited. So um, we talked about this a little bit in the pre-roll, but you, I believe, are in a basement in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, that leads me into my first question, which are is- Are you kidnapped? Yeah. <laughs> no. Blink are you okay? You're, you're right. No, this, this translucent color is all natural that you're seeing right now. <laughs> I've been in a basement for 20 odd years. By choice, um, I choose not to go outside because the only thing um, worse than going outside is approaching small talk outside. I, I've got no interest oh in God. small talk. With, what would I, mean, I prefer to just be a dallier? You know. What would Huberman Point. say, Dan? What would Huberman say? I mean, let's be honest. Okay, so um, you are from and grew up in Canada and started off, I think, your athletic career as a hockey player. But um, that that just sort of leads me into, you know, before we get into talking about all the stuff that you're currently doing, of which there is a thousand things, we and we're very excited, and a lot of questions, maybe if you could just give us a little backstory on how you got to where you are, your athletic, bank, uh, your athletic background, and you know, how you came to be interested in what it is you're now doing. Sure. So yeah, I had a, like a lot of people are in the industry, I had a very intrinsic interest. It's something where um, I never felt pushed to learn more about this stuff. I always felt pulled. It's always been like a natural curiosity and a natural, natural compulsion of mine 
to continue um, uh, researching all things biology, every single metabolic pathway, anything and everything that I can do. And it did start with athletics. I do appreciate that you called it an athletic career. Um, I, I don't want to correct that. It makes me sound better than I actually am. But um, I, uh, I was blessed with suboptimal genetics. And uh, it is a blessing in disguise because you're forced to figure out all the ways in which to optimize the things that you weren't naturally given. So I was on mm. these these ancient fossils called forums and uh, magazines <laughs> and these types of things that people don't even know about anymore. I was on those every single day. I started uh, my dad got me a weight training set when I was 14 years old from a garage sale. And uh, I, I literally have not taken a unplanned week off since. So I'm 35 now. I've been training for 21 years without a single uh week off that wasn't already planned. I absolutely love this stuff. And um, <clears throat> what I'm doing now, that's just slowly and progressively turned into being very excited about the little things. I, I was forced to mold a, a philosophy regarding nutrition and human performance revolving around very, very high pressure situations because my career went in the way of high stress equals high reward. I work with athletes in uh, over a dozen professional sports at an extremely high level. And in those worlds, there's no such thing as a small detail. So every single 1% I can earn is uh, contextually relevant. Sometimes, some, sometimes a lot of people just need to control energy balance. They just need to control macronutrients. They just need to get big rocks out of the way. And for almost everybody, that will get you to your destination. But when there is $100 million on the line, which there absolutely has been in my career, I need that 1% difference is a giant thing to me. So I've, uh, I've gone through this process of um, becoming very familiar with the things that give me confidence because at that level you can't guess so i needed to be as objective as possible i needed to take my own bias out of the situation because anybody who has self-awareness mm. knows that they have bias but i also needed to take my clients bias out of the situation too because i didn't want them to um, guide themselves in a direction that they shouldn't or possibly guide me in a direction that they shouldn't. So I've leaned a lot on very, very objective markers, which has been lab-based analysis and programming over the course of my career. Did you, there's a couple of things that are just remarkable there. I mean, just yesterday we were talking about how Juliet and I pine for the old days of beginner gains yeah. where you're like, hey, eat a little bit more carbohydrate before, after you work out and People like I added 300 pounds to my deadlift, you know, just, it's so easy to do those fun things. I just got shredded. And what'd you do? Well, I you know, stopped having the extra cake at night. Um, you, these one, these small increments really hint at this kind of philosophy that we have, which is, you know, that um, one is it's difficult to make these big changes and we really have to have clear objective measures when we do that. And I, I feel like, I know we're going to get into nutrition and blood work massively, but it wasn't, it just hasn't been very obvious to us who are sort of lay people who are trying to understand these small differences in this 1% advantage where we get objective measures around nutrition, you know, just, you know, besides weight and sort of subjective feel, it, it doesn't feel that way. I'm so interested how you got to sort of blood work and, and nutrition as sort of this really holy grail for you and the work that you're doing with your athletes. Sure. Yeah. So like that, I, like I said, I was molded into who I am. Like it, that pressure forced my philosophy. And the, an example of pressure is um, a story I've told. I, I coached Michael Bisping in 2015. He's the former UFC world middleweight title, uh, middleweight champion. And that's really funny because I was coaching um, this guy named George St. Pierre in the last fight against Bisping. Oh, that's oh. funny. <laughs> <laughs> it, actually, I, I was not working with Mike at that point, too. So I'm not going to take that out. He's a monster. <laughs> I'm just saying he's a, he's such a monster and a rad human. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So the high pressure situations like two and a half weeks out, um, Mike was uh, Mike was doing well. He's on a he's on a hot streak. And then uh, Luke Rockhold was the middleweight champion and uh, a fighter had pulled out of the title fight about two and a half weeks out and Bisping was the backup. 
And Bisping called wow. me. I'm looking at my phone. It was Bisping, comma, M. Like, well, this has to be something. Yeah. <laughs> Something's happening right now. So I pick up and he said, uh, Garner, I got the title. I got the title shot, man. Uh, two and a half weeks out, I am going to be fighting Luke. And I'm like, all right, holy shit. What's your weight? And, and he wow. said something like 213. And I was like, okay, I'm going to send you something now. And we're going to start now. <laughs> and uh, uh, I got like on the phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was in, he was actually in Toronto filming a movie. So like it was totally non-ideal scenarios. He's he's filming a movie in Toronto. Gives me gets the title shot. Gives me a call two thirteen. I'm like holy shit. And then it's my job to get him to one eighty five point zero in two and a half weeks. Wow. So point zero. That's that's oh that's God. championship weight. So you have to be. There's no like a pound allowance. So it's one eighty five point zero in two and a half weeks. And we also need. Wait, so you can't be like one eighty four point eight? Can you be below? No, you can be 1. below. Point oh, you can be below. Okay, but you couldn't be one eighty five point one. You're correct. Out. You sound like such a dilettante when you say that about boxing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, when you are when you're over, you, you in in a lot of um, non title fights, you get a pound, so you can be one eighty six. Um, but if you're mm. over in a championship fight, it's not allowed. A giant percentage I of your that. purse is gone, your fight purse, or the fight's just simply canceled. The person doesn't want to, to follow through with this. And um, you lose a payday after a whole fight camp. So it's my job to not just get him to that exact number, but we have to maintain cognitive function. We have to maintain conditioning. We have to maintain KL power. We have to do all of these things. And y y there's no- 28 pounds. What's that? 28 pounds. Yes. Is significant right? amount right and you have to what i'm given and and what i'm paid to do is i'm given a specific subset of variables and a specific time frame and then i just have to figure how how, how i'm gonna make that work and how we're gonna do this thing and then uh that he made it happen or i made it happen he made it happen left hook ko won the title um just recently in wow. august was the exact same thing kind of all over again um sean o'malley i've uh, been working with sean for about five years now and um he just won the ufc bantamweight title uh second round right straight ko i have to get him to 135.0 again maintaining cognitive function maintaining conditioning maintaining ko power um there, there's a lot of pressure when it comes to that because if any of those factors are off, that's my fault. That's my bad. And that is not just like, hey, I didn't look the way I wanted to on my wedding, or I didn't look the way I wanted to on my vacation, or hey, I got I got fourth place. It's millions of dollars. Yeah, I got fourth place in my regional bikini show or bodybuilding show. <laughs> you know, and no, this is this is literally millions and millions and millions of dollars on the line wow. on that like single little premise. So I know, I know I, Juliet has something to say, but I, I want to say that just, I really love how you feel like as a coach, you take complete ownership. And I just want to acknowledge as a coach piece, just saying that how you, that pressure to really say that it's going to be on you as a coach to figure out the right solutions for this person. That's really incredible coaching. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my follow up to that is, you know, um, without you giving away any of your proprietary secrets at 30,000 feet, what, what, how do you help someone lose 28 pounds in two and a half weeks without sacrificing all the other I mean, things you listed there? I mean, if, if Juliet again, skips breakfast, she's all heady. Obviously, and weak. obviously that knowledge is worth a lot of money. So I don't expect you to give away your deep, dark secrets, but you know, is like top what, three things. Yeah. Like what do you do? How do you do that? Uh, How's that even possible? So a part and distinction first to make is that it is weight loss. It is not fat loss. There's a giant distinction between those two things. You are losing weight to make weight. You are not losing body fat to make weight. If I was trying to create a type of caloric deficit in two and a half weeks to lose over 20 pounds, my, my man would be deceased by the time he walked into the octagon. <laughs> How much Ozempic is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. That's the whole protocol. That's my proprietary information, actually. Uh, no, no, it's a, it's a phasic process, and I break it out between passive weight loss strategies and active weight loss strategies. So from a passive perspective, 
depending upon where the athlete's at about set and this is um weight class wide this is this is reflective of making weight for powerlifting as it is for fighting as it is for wrestling whatever it's going to be about seven to ten days out depending upon where their weight's at that's when i am going to pull carbohydrates but bring fats up because i'm sure a lot of the listeners know for about every one gram of carbohydrates you store you are going to store three to four grams of glycogen uh, or what rather water along with it to store it as a form of glycogen and when we drop that if you're at 2000 calories per day and i can keep you at 2000 calories per day but replace your carbohydrates with fat i'm going to easily get about eight pounds out of you easily and that's why a lot of people think super low carb dieting works but they're really just losing weight not just not necessarily body fat but in my performance context um that works fantastic for me because then i'm able to get a ton of weight out of that fighter and they're able to not drop calories but drop a ton of weight so cognition is still there i'm able to still get a ton of benefits from protein and fiber there um the meals aren't abysmal at that point yet you're still able to eat <laughs> um this whole process is actually um, not nearly as bad as it sounds for somebody who's going to lose about eight pounds in about four days you know, it's, 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 wow. it's so impressive. Right. So then we'll, okay. So cool. we'll do, uh, you got some, cause I got some go, please. We're, we're okay, all, well, go, we have so much to talk about. We're so, excited. so I just want to go back to a point you made earlier because I was recently having a conversation about this with a um, friend of ours, who's a coach of college level athletes. And it was the thing you said about sort of not, not defining yourself as a like, super amazing athlete. And then that is what, what sort of piqued your interest in how you could optimize the other things. And I relate a lot to that because I was a rower in high school and college, but I'm only five foot six. And so I always, in my own sad early nineties way, the only way I knew how to optimize was just try to be more fit than the really big, tall girls. Right. That was how I was able to optimize. But these days I feel like there's so much out there information wise that's available to, you know, athletes who fall into that category. Like maybe they aren't the most genetically or athletically gifted, um, but, but they're in the game, you know, what would be, and, and maybe this is an oversimplified question, but for those kinds of athletes, are there like three or four things that you would be looking at to say, okay, you may not be six foot two, you're only five, six, but because of that, you're going to need to pay extra close attention to X, Y, and Z. Okay. Well, I think, that makes yeah, sense. yeah. I think that one of the biggest things, honestly, and it's going to sound like a cop-out answer, but it's, it's not, it is to just get a coach and follow singularly their system. Like you kind of opened the question with, there's so much information out there. That's a giant problem. And it's a, even a problem among experts. And they kind of pretend that it's not their problem just because they have subject matter expertise. Mm -hmm. But what they'll do is they'll read 10 books and not really apply any of them. It would be so much more valuable to read one book and apply it in its entirety. That's like, that's where somebody is truly going to be able to master something, understand a system and have a new tool. Like that's a, that's a big part of why I actually like certifications still more than just podcasts or books or something like that. So certification always gives you a tool. Now I actually have a toolkit. I don't just know something new. I understand something new. That's like a totally different frame in which understanding allows you to actually apply it to a context rather than just know a certain subset of variables that if that context happens to come across you, you're able to apply it based on what they discussed in that article or, or a podcast or whatever it was. But a certification is actually a tool. So if somebody is not necessarily genetically blessed, um, I myself was that way. I did not grow very tall. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have to keep growing wider if I'm going to be any formidable person I'm good in any that. arena. I'm, here. I'm not a dabbler in getting wider. <laughs> Point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for real, this is, uh, this is something that I would apply to people with suboptimal genetics is that you do need to truly learn a system and create a signal in the noise unless you collect a lot of data. So it is very common in the in the world of health and fitness to eliminate variables so if you're going to go for a goal just go for one goal so that you can eliminate the noise and just follow that one signal based on trial and error that is excellent advice if you have absolutely no data to work with if you're just somebody trying right. something or if you went through a basic intake questionnaire then you probably want to just pick one thing so you can focus on one thing but if you do a more comprehensive analysis, I truly believe that the quality of a program 
will be predicated upon the quality of your analysis because the quality of your analysis is what's going to determine the biggest things that you need to move forward with first. And somebody who has genetics, like, I don't know, man, I've come across a lot of hard gainers who I've got jacked and they just really didn't know <laughs> where they need to focus on. There is certain a hormone out of value or a micronutrient out of value or their nutrition wasn't consistent or their nutrition wasn't built in a way that they can maintain consistency with. Um, I think a lot of people's, uh, their own, they will fulfill the label that they have placed upon themselves. If you believe you have bad genetics, you will. If you believe you're a hard gainer, then you probably are. If you believe that you won't lose body fat, you probably won't. These things, we have a real funny way of fulfilling these labels. And the more comprehensive your analysis, the more able you are to identify the constraint that is creating the mindset that you're currently fostering. I'm going to quote you on this need for certification, need for attending seminars. I love that. I think that's so great. And I think it's probably why people love to listen to podcasts because you feel like you've added something to your toolbox, but you've just, you know, been a dalliance, right? You've just been, you've, <laughs> you've been a dallier. <laughs> you're a dallier. Um, one of the things that I think I really respect about your work is this sort of holistic systems approach in that, you, as you say, it's really about understanding and synthesizing the information that you're seeing. And I always, for everyone, you know, a good example of this is some of the Romanian Bulgarian weightlifting models, which were three or four movements in a tightly like run community that was autocratic with lots of drugs. And they could really see inputs and outputs very well. Nice. And uh, weightlifting uh, plus drugs, wait, right? And they could. You were like, oh, I can see why that model was so successful because they were just able to pare back so many variables and just juice and unjuice and lift and unlift. As we're trying to work through um, complex movement behaviors and understand why people may be in pain or why people are, you know, susceptible to injuries, you know, we've had to back into talking about sleep and, and really, and not just giving it lip service. Cause I think people just do, but really understanding, you know, what are the things that affect your sleep? Well, it turns out you're just under fueled and now we have to back into, you know, fueling conversations and how well, that's why we started talking about standing desks and walking in like 2010. Right. Like we, we are known as like the standing desk people. And we're like, well, that wasn't really the plan. We just were trying to tell people to move more. And we were, we were solving problems <laughs> and athletes around sort of this, trying to yeah. understand their environment. Yeah. Um, as we sort of switch around, one of the things that I really love about the work on your blood panels and understanding that is that it really gives me this concrete sort of snapshot of short-term history, long-term history of an aggregation of a whole bunch of behaviors. And we've seen lots of blood work happen in the last 10 years, but people still don't really feel very actionable about that. You know, they, you know, they, they sort of get this metric now, like you, people are like A1C, you know, only because they, they talk about it on television as relates to Ozempic. Right. But um, I don't think people really have a clear understanding as a lay person of, of some of the fact that the blood can tell you what's happening in real time and what sort of your historical data is. And I don't think, coaches have any idea about how to begin that conversation without having a physician involved. And as we get around to this, one of the things I'm so excited about is I feel like the work that you're doing with you and your partners is you're bringing this to the language of coaches and you're bringing this to the, to the actionable aspect of athletes doing their thing. So anyway, I, you, Julia, it's like, well, you have no point. Yeah. I was like, what are you talking My about? My point is how question. did you get to this actionable piece <laughs> of becoming such an expert, you're a coach and a really good coach, but how do you become known as sort of this blood whisperer? Um, having looked at over a thousand blood analysis in my career, easily over a thousand as a coach yourself, you understand that there's no replacement for repetition. When, when you are able to look at so many things and get that type of experience, um, you're able to, to identify trends and patterns that move into art rather than science. Um, that's like a real key, key point that people need to actually start seeing art in objectivity. So like a beautiful part about labs is that they don't give a shit how you feel about them. The result is going to be the result is going to be the result. 
that is like the the beauty of science with respect to data collection on your client and being able to remove bias from the process. With that said, mm -hmm. there is still art to be found there. And this is something that has uh, separated me from many other people is that there are relationships and patterns between biomarkers outside of just the biomarkers themselves. And that the, the hunt for what a biomarker means is so much more than just a recipe book approach. So a lot of people are currently stuck in the mindset of taking a recipe book approach to biomarkers. So if this is low, take this supplement. If this is high, take this supplement. They, they, it, chemistry is much more complicated than that. And one of the most one of the most insightful questions I've come across in my entire career that I'd want the entire audience to go away with is, huh, I wonder why the body thought that was a good idea. The, the bot, that question right there is, huh, I wonder why the body thought that was a good idea. That question by itself will lead you down a path of identifying a root cause that triggered the alteration in that biomarker. You're not supposed to look at a biomarker and then sledgehammer it with either a medication or a supplement. You're supposed to look at a biomarker and ask yourself, why is it off? Because the body, biology is way smarter than we will ever be. Biology has answered questions that we don't even know are questions yet. So when you see something's high or low, I'm not arrogant enough to say, do that, do that. I, I always want to explore okay, what available literature do we have on this biomarker that would cause this adaptation? Because that is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at an adaptation. There was a stimulus or a stressor somewhere in physiology that resulted in the adaptation of this biomarker. That is something that has uh, made me, as, as you would say, a type of blood whisperer with simply asking more <laughs> questions. I know I'm not, I'm looking at a picture, but I need to dive deeper from a thought perspective to see the deeper picture behind the numbers that I'm looking at. The second thing is the identification of patterns and being able to translate that in real time. So like one of the easiest examples that I always provide people is uh, albumin. Albumin is a protein made by the liver and it is brought up in the presence of dehydration, but it is also a negative acute phase reactant. So it is brought down in the presence of inflammation. Can somebody be dehydrated and inflamed at the same time? Yes. What? Yeah, I, I think I'm thinking about all the friends. Exactly. I have. So then what happens to that biomarker when it's been pulled up and then pulled back down? Suddenly mm. we have something in the normal range that isn't normal at all. Okay, that is that is known as a pattern. That is a biomarker that has found its home in normal despite two severe stressors, which are dehydration and inflammation. So the identification of patterns, um, and there are many, many patterns that represent, you know, injury resiliency, bone breakdown, hypochlorhydria, um, vitamin C insufficiencies, B6, B12, folate. There's so many things that um, that are representative from a pattern perspective, even if everything is in the normal range. And that's like, that's where that beautiful 1% comes at a time. So if you're able to identify the root cause to an issue and then identify the pattern that is likely the resultant or reflective of that root cause, then now you're on to designing a true objective unbiased protocol for that person that's actually going to help them after even after you're gone like if somebody doesn't hire me again i don't consider that a loss i consider that hey man i helped you Let, let's shake hands i actually helped you you are no longer dependent upon me because i destroyed your root cause and now you can perform in my absence that's a win to me and that that's like a, that's that's something i'm always after when looking at labs and that's something doable when you look at labs so quick question before I ask my actual question is, can you define negative acute phase reactant for our listeners? Sure. So in the presence of inflammation, so if you were pro-inflamed from, uh, say, uh, blood sugar instability, or if you are pro-inflamed from training, or if you're pro-inflamed from um, any type of exposure to some type of pollutant, um, you could be pro-inflamed from, to use your guys' example discussing previously, a lack of sleep, very consistent with increases in C-reactive protein, which is an acute inflammatory 
protein. Um, you can even compile that with erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is a chronic inflammatory marker. So if you're looking at something and like albumin looks totally normal and their food log is not that much water in it um, or electrolytes for that matter, C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is quite elevated, then you're actually beginning to build this pattern. Wait, albumin is not normal at all. And this person is pro-inflamed. They're absolutely dehydrated. So an acute phase reactant, though, in its most simple form is something that will go down in the presence of inflammation. Okay. Awesome. So I want to dive a little bit more into the recipe book idea, because I think this is really interesting. And I heard you talking about this on another podcast and, you know, just to emphasize it, I think where we've been in the past 10 years with this sort of new interest and, um, you know, with lots more people getting more comprehensive blood panels is exactly that where it's like, okay, I get my comprehensive panel. I see my vitamin D is 35 okay, I'm going to take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D just as an example. And I think that's what you mean by the recipe book approach. And often the only sort of treatment model is moving into supplements saying, okay, well, you're down in this particular marker. And if there's a supplement that might improve it, we're going to prescribe that supplement. And uh, I heard you on another podcast talking about vitamin D in particular as an example and why vitamin D as, as a marker um, isn't actually that useful because there's so many other things that contribute to your vitamin D being high or low besides just vitamin D. And, and I don't know if that's the right example. There may be some other marker that people are familiar with. I just think most people have heard of vitamin D, but maybe if you could just sort of dive a little deeper on one specific marker and the sort of why the recipe book approach isn't really that effective <clears throat> in many cases. Of course. No, vitamin D is definitely a super, super easy marker to, to discuss. I'll actually, I'll, I'll bring up a paper that I have in my computer so that I can quote it here. Um, it is, it's something that uh, I think a, a lot of the, uh, the, the listeners here would find um, quite fascinating regarding vitamin D. So you just asked me, what is the definition of a negative acute phase reactant? I said, it's something that goes down in the presence of inflammation. So there's a paper uh, by Waldron et al. called Vitamin D, a Negative Acute Phase Reactant. Um, <laughs> conclusion, serum vitamin D is a negative acute phase reactant, which has implications for acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. Serum vitamin D is an unreliable bio biomarker of vitamin D status, right? To, to repeat. You should probably say that again. Ser you say serum that again. <laughs> vitamin D is an unreliable biomarker for vitamin D. I want everyone to actually really get a grip of that. So that is that is something that goes down in the presence of inflammation. And it's like somebody really trying to drive up their vitamin D um, in, in an unhealthy state or possibly even in a healthy state and just dealing with acute inflammation from training or something like that, then that is someone that is going to have a false reading in vitamin D that they should not be penalized for by being forced to take 10,000 IU of vitamin D. By the way, that thank that, you. That mindset, that that's a bizarre mindset to me. Um, I'll just go on record to say that, like, if somebody is already on five thousand IU of vitamin D, and then it didn't go up, and it's like, well, maybe I should take ten thousand. Well, it didn't go up again. Let's rock fifteen. Let's rock twenty. It's like no, like you have. Hey, why does the body think this is a good idea? I'm literally taking thousands of IU of vitamin D. In terms of sun exposure, this is a crazy amount. So why is it this going up? I am force feeding vitamin D into myself. You have to, it's not as simple as the recipe book and you can hurt yourself. Like vitamin D, it's a, it's a good example. So like number one, lead, in the presence of lead, vitamin D has been demonstrated to decrease because a lot of people don't know vitamin D one of its primary mechanisms is that it is involved in the uptake of heavy metals. So it's actually already been seen in the literature that in the presence of lead exposure, our body will reduce vitamin D concentrations as a protective mechanism to not uptake more lead. So imagine somebody's plumbing with, say, old school, and they are exposed to lead on a semi-regular basis, and then they have a consistently low vitamin D. And then in order to try and bring up their vitamin D, they take 5, 10, 15, 20,000. Well, now you're actually force feeding lead into your system, which your body was trying to protect you from. Your body is smarter than you and your body is smarter than a pill. So you need, you should be aware that 
a sledgehammer approach to something, if even that's a 5,000 IU is freaking plenty, it's plenty. And when, th when that is not moving, there is something else going on. Air pollutants have been demonstrated to lower vitamin D. BPA has been demonstrated to lower vitamin D. Boron has been demonstrated to increase vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is actually also dependent upon glutathione metabolism. So glutathione supplementation and even glutathione precursors like NAC have been demonstrated to significantly increase vitamin D in the absence of vitamin D supplementation. So vitamin D improves purely as a byproduct of glutathione metabolism, as opposed to actually just taking more vitamin D. The, the, the examples continue to go on forever. Vitamin D has many manipulating factors. And by the way, we're still on one biomarker. There's, this is reflective <laughs> right. of all of these biomarkers. There are many things that bring biomarkers up, and there's many things that bring biomarkers down. So it is a real mission of mine. And as you know, it, it might sound cheesy, but I actually do believe that it's my purpose on this earth to change blood work because there's such a gaping knowledge that is not being utilized for health, for longevity, for performance that, that no one's truly leveraging <clears throat> at this point with respect to creating technology that accounts for art. If you have technology that accounts for art, then you're able to scale and leverage a algorithm that truly helps people rather than just recommends them supplements. That's, that's a, it's a completely different way of thinking. When you control for patterns and when you control for context, when you control for manipulating factors, it's a hell of a lot of work. And it's a, it takes a hell of a lot of experience and scientific rigor to get that done. But that needs to be done. Blood work is the best. It's the most objective tool that we have in front of us. It's the most scientifically accurate in terms of testing. There's a reason you can get it in Hong Kong, Toronto, LA, Hawaii, Moscow. It's, it's the most scientifically accurate. And the machines behind it are the most sophisticated and precise in terms of extrapolation. Like we have we, right in front of us. We have this thing that gives us this huge physiological picture of the entire body. And we're not using it. And we've got decades of, of, of data that we can call upon in order to leverage this thing. And we're not doing it yet. Um, that, this, this is the next movement of the industry in terms of objectively controlling people's health and utilizing markers that represent past, present, and future to, to help them more, help them in more ways than they've ever known blood work could. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Element. And you know, what we wanted to talk about today is how Element has stuck with us for oh, many man. years. It is sticky. Like, you know, we, okay, moment of vulnerability here. There's a lot of stuff that shows up in our house in packages. Why is this a moment of vulnerability? It drives you crazy, and I love it. And I'm trying to be transparent to the people that we are given a lot of yeah. things. Try this we out. Lucky yeah. enough to get a lot of it's things. It's super to cool try out. for me. It's not super. You're like, God, ah, it's too much. <laughs> you freak out sometimes when there's when there's stuff. And I'm not going to say that I, you know, don't like Amazon, but um, Element has been around and is around. I have a bottle of Hot Element right downstairs. Yeah, I mean, from basically the day we got our first box of Element, yeah. we've been having Element in our house Remember, and I drinking it on a daily I basis. I discovered it, us doing a Beast Spartan race in Tahoe. Someone gave me a sample, and I was like, this is great. Yeah, and ever since then, we have it around. We share it as much as we can. We drink it literally every day. Our kids drink it, and it's just this like static thing in our lives where many other products and things have come and gone. Element is this steady part of our lives. Our friends come to our house. And they're like, "Hey, do you have an Element?" Like, <laughs> I feel like sometimes I'm a little bit like an Element pusher, or people are taking advantage of me because of my love of Element. Well, it's true. Right now, uh, if you want to drink it every day, like we do. Go to, you can order and get a free sample pack with all of the Element's flavors. Go to drinkelement.com slash TRS. This episode of our podcast is brought to you by our friends at Momentus. J-Star, you were just talking about a multivitamin study. What was that? So our friend, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, found my fitness, posted about a study that uh, concluded that a daily multivitamin supplement can significantly boost memory and slow cognitive aging in older adults compared to placebo. And what's cool about this is 
the simplicity of taking a multivitamin is pretty epic. And if it has really important cognitive benefits for the general population, that's pretty amazing. And it also confirms what you and I have been doing, which is taking the momentous multivitamin along with a few other things every day. And it's, it's cool to know that it's helping, helping from a cognitive standpoint. Yeah. I think the way I kind of think about it is it's impossible for me to get all the organic minerals, fruits and vegetables, and like the best soil, best, I just can't do it. And so I'm just filling in the gaps of minimums for some of these things. And I think the way we think about multivitamins sort of two ways is wrong. One is that you're still thinking about Flintstone, which was like a <laughs> mass produced vitamin that's so bad. I don't think that even counts as a multivitamin. No, probably not. And number two is um, just the fact that you think that taking multivitamins is gonna make you awesome today. It's gonna fill in the gaps for your whole food nutrition and it's about the long game, right? I think that's where it's really difficult to see. Like, I, I, I'm i not sure I PR'd on my workout today because of my multivitamin, but what I can tell you is that, hey, I'm gonna make sure that I'm getting the micronutrients I need to support all the processes. And what's cool is a multivitamin is a really low effort way to do something that now is showing in multiple studies to Im positively impact You're saying brain you health. I just existed on like bagels and like I don't brown know if, foods I don't for the know day. if that would really help. I could just add a multivitamin in? Yeah. I like your stuff. Yeah, I, th I just, I think in, you know, these days there's a lot of pe things people are taking, yeah, but yeah. the multivitamin you is still that. like a tried and true important yeah. part of that piece. I agree with that 100%. Uh, if you want to know more, go to livemomentous.com slash TRS and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase. We could have taken the whole conversation and podcast to this point and talked about range of motion instead of biomarkers. I really just this principled systems approach, the way you're looking at this, why is the body solving this problem in this way? I love that. <clears throat> One of the things that is sort of been a radical approach in our work is trying to remove the physical therapist and the medical provider from understanding and restoring range of motion. And we've tried to move as many tools as we can. And into, pain too, and pain. That's right. <clears throat> as many tools as we can at, sort of out of the shadows as unskilled care and say, hey, this is actually the domain of the coach and this is the domain of the person in terms of trying to give them tools and tactics to manage their pain, uh, restore their range of motion, sort of look at, at movement minimums, understand how those things are dynamic and changing. And that has been a big task. I feel like, one of the things I'm hearing from you is that a lot of this information, we've hinted at this, really dem it belongs in the domain of coaching and as a lay person saying, I should be able to get my blood and understand what's happening. Am I hearing that right? Yeah. That this isn't, I don't need a physician or I shouldn't always have to have a physician between me and understand what my blood is saying about me? Yeah, you shouldn't because it's not always a medical problem. That's the thing too. Like that, that's very important to understand. Like I've got this health skill that's um, hilariously simple, but I use it to make a point. Um, it's a three point scale. Okay. On, on this side, you have death. Okay. <laughs> you are deceased. In the middle, you have fake health, which is where 90% of the population lives. And then at the end, you have true optimal health. So death, very straightforward to understand. You are gone. Fake health. This is where 90% of the population lives because they perceive health to be the idea that only represents the absence of disease. I don't agree with that ideology because this person in the world of fake health, they might not have a diagnosable condition, but they have low libido, they have low energy, they have brain fog, um, they, they have difficulty building muscle, dropping body fat. Um, they don't want to do vacations that require activity. Like they don't want to do the safari or the hike or the mountain climb. They don't want to do those things. This is, this is someone who might not have a disease, but does anyone really want to be this person? No, okay, I want to be this guy over here in the world of real health. This is someone who is vibrating on a different frequency. Their ability to translate their thoughts into words is right there. They have energy, they want to train, they want to do stuff, they have libido, they're great partners, they're great um, uh, parents. Like they, they, they have the energy to go do these things that, that are reflective of, the, of their values and their core priorities in life. That is somebody who is actually healthy. So somebody shouldn't have to always speak to someone about disease in order to understand their blood because it doesn't have to be about that at all. 
it can actually just be about you getting that final 10% out of yourself so that you have a better attention span so you can be more productive at work. Like the, these little things can absolutely be done. And the like what you're talking about in terms of like range of motion, like I, I'm no biomechanics expert at all, but it sounds like like what you're referring to is like a compensation. Okay. And that's what I actually look at in biomarkers. If something's high or low, that's about chemical compensation. So I'm looking at how the body, because the body, we know that beautiful intelligence that the body has, it's compensating somehow. And it is determined based upon evolutionary biology's hierarchy that that was the right thing to do. It is actually doing it for a reason of protection or safety or um, whatever it's going to do. Like a uh, uh, Billy Rubin can be a good example here. Billy Rubin is a, a byproduct of red blood cell destruction. So every 120 days, uh, we have new red blood cells. So you can imagine four months from now, you'll have new blood, which is pretty cool. Uh, Billy Rubin is a byproduct of that turnover. So you'll see bilirubin increase if there's a lot of hemolysis, hemo, blood, lysis, breakdown, because it's the byproduct of that red blood cell turnover. However, what's not measured on labs, you can actually see it in biochemical charts. You have bilirubin. You also have this thing called biliveridin. Biliveridin is a metabolite of bilirubin, but it is a fat-soluble antioxidant. So sometimes you will see bilirubin very, 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 very low. And it is low because bilirubin is being robbed by this thing called biliveridin that is being utilized as a fat-soluble antioxidant elsewhere, somewhere in the body, to deal with inflammatory issues. That's nothing more than a compensation. That's what it is. Like That's just a very low biomarker compensating based upon the current physiological context. And when someone actually is able to look at that and be able to ascertain what to do with their supplements and their nutrition after that, they've got the next tool that's going to remove the next constraint that is going to allow them to be a better version of themselves. I love that. And I just think all I could think about as you were saying that is I was like, wow, when I squat, my foot turns out to the right because I am commenting. I was just thinking about well, squatting. I love, <laughs> first of all, that... I was concerned that my teenage daughters, when we go on vacation, don't want to do activities. I was like, oh, obviously they're in a disease state. Yeah, they're, they're in the 90%. <laughs> they just want to lay on the or beach. They don't yeah. want to hike. Hey, they don't want to suffer. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, you just explained my teenage daughters. That's first of all, that's amazing. That could just be like a byproduct of being a teenager. Yeah, though. that's compensation, that's like, teenager yeah. compensation. Yeah, exactly. Um, second is I really, you know, I, I use the word compensation. We started talking about errors and fault. That was the language we inherited as physical yeah. therapists. And we started saying compensation as a way of saying, and then we got just hammered for compensation. They're like, it's the strategy. And I was like, okay, so it's your body strategy to deal with your crappy dehydration. I, I love it. So I, I feel like you just gave me the compensation word back and I'm gonna be like, no, it's, you know, it's your body working this problem. Um, do you, do you have yeah. something to say? Go ahead. I have okay. other things, but I realized I was, I'm getting excited about this. I know, it's so exciting. Okay, so I just wanna, try to go back to the most basic here for people who, because I think we all live in this universe, you know, Kelly and I first started getting these really comprehensive blood planet panels, like way back in 2012. And, you know, we, we both had, you know, significant learnings and it, you know, changed a lot of the ways we do things and think about things. And so, you know, we're on board and we, I think really get it. I would say, um, I would say, and you've heard us say it on people have listened to the podcast. It saved your life. Yeah. It, it saved my life, which we don't need to get into that, but, but, I guess, you know, for someone listening to this, who's blood work curious, I would say, and maybe they're the kind of person who gets a physical once a year and gets sort of the standard issue, like five biomarkers that your normal physician would get. How should they be thinking about this? You know, or what would you suggest they do differently? You know, and, and again, I realize you don't have time on this podcast to list all the biomarkers that you would, you know, suggest people get tested on the regular are there categories or, or categories, or is there a resource you can point people to, to say, Hey, these are the things that I would suggest you get tested and, and also how often, you know, like where yeah, should like my question who, was going to be like, how, how soon can my blood tell me what's happening? 
Yeah. And because I, I really do appreciate one of the things that we've learned over time is being able to watch trends. You know, you may get markers that look perfectly fine, but it, it's interesting to note that, you know, if something's going up or down, you take note of that, like exactly, you know, asking your question is why is my body doing that? Why is it going up? Why is it going down? Um, so I think that's another way to think about it. But yeah, if people are like, okay, I'm blood work curious, like where do I begin? What should I be looking for? Oh, first of all, I like that um, Kelly brings up that the the daughters they don't want to go on vacation, so they're just living in fake hell. And then and then you bring up that something <laughs> saved your life, and you're like, no, we don't need to talk about that. So we needed we needed to talk about the daughters, but not something that saved your life. <laughs> TRT, Ozone. yeah, there we go. I like it. I'm on board. Okay, um, when it comes to um, Somebody dipping their toes into blood work, like, gosh, if, if you're just dipping your toes into blood work and by definition, you haven't done much of it, go get it done. This is like one of the most important things you'll ever do for your life, not just for optimal health, but also just for standard health. Like it is very important to stay on top of this um, for many, many reasons. Your blood is the window. It's this beautiful physiological picture of your entire body because like a stool test, although a stool test is something that I run on a lot of my athletes. Its value is quite localized to the gastrointestinal tract, whereas a blood test, its value is system wide because it provides the the communication and the mailing service for every single organ that has a blood supply, which is all of them. This is why you get brain <laughs> markers and heart markers and kidney markers and liver markers, gut, immune, hormone, micronutrient, you name it. It's all in the blood. So like you get this beautiful physiological portrait of this person that you're looking at. And this gives you this systemic view that no saliva, urine, or stool analysis ever could. Blood is, blood is the absolute champion of lab analysis, not just for physiological complete picture, but also for scientific rigor. So go get your blood test done, number one. Number two, um, if, if you want to get the most valuable markers done, just get a CBC and a CMP. That is a complete blood count and a complete metabolic panel. If you need to ask, ask your doctor um, about it, he will know exactly what you're talking about. It was a couple of the most popular panels in the entire world. It's a part of like someone's like yearly physical. So go order a CBC and a CMP. Both of those are incredibly cheap for anybody to afford. And lots of times they're also just going to be covered by insurance. So go get it done. Get a CBC and a CMP. Now, in terms of frequency, once a year, it's okay. Twice a year is the sweet spot for pretty much everybody. But then more frequent than that is somebody who's like really after optimization. So that's when you would move into either quarterly or trimesters, where you can do three times a year or four times a year. Um, but that's really, that's kind of how I would break it down. It's once a year is okay. Twice a year is a sweet spot for everybody. Um, for, for pretty much everybody, unless you are very elite and serious, like you are some athlete or, um, and, and real type a CEO that loves data and crunching numbers and wants to optimize everything. Or if you're somebody who is just, perhaps you're in a health debt. I know a lot of guys who've like exited companies and in order for make, in order to make that company exitable, they destroyed their bodies to make that happen with a lot of stress <laughs> and a lot of no sleep and a lot of uh, traveling and suboptimal dieting. So if you have to play catch up, then probably quarterly blood work would be good. Anything beyond quarterly is completely unnecessary. So I will say that your boundaries are basically from quarterly to once a year. And then your markers would be from the CBC and the CMP. Giant asterisk, I want to say to all of this is that the value is not in the lab. The value is in the lab interpretation. You, yeah. you yeah. can have me make you a beef Wellington, which is Gordon Ramsay's famous dish, or you can have him make it. Okay. I have trouble making peanut butter toast. So I, even though it's the exact same food, I'm going to do a terrible job with it. I've seen that crazy hard in the lab interpretation world too, where you get somebody to read your labs and they do kind of just a recipe book approach. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't have experience. Um, as, as is the same thing in physiotherapy, as is the same in personal training, as is the same in any industry, there's people who it's their whole existence. And then there's people where it's kind of just their job. Um, so 
that's basically what I would recommend, the frequency at which I would recommend, and then also find somebody who's freaking good at what they do. Um, at the at the risk of sounding self-promotional here, um, I do have my own software coming out in January called Vitality. That is, um, it is an amalgamation of 10 years of me identifying my own optimal reference ranges, my own patterns, my own ratios, calculations, um, past, present, predictive factors, generating training, nutrition, lifestyle, and supplemental recommendations from it. Um, it's I, I made very clear intentions to inject art into science. And um, I can't wait until the thing's done. So if, if the listeners can wait until January, then um, depending upon when this comes out, actually, I'm not even sure when this will be out. But um, <laughs> that is that is absolutely um, what I would recommend, because that is the most leverageable way to get a real interpretation on something. Yeah, and we'll definitely um, link to that in our show notes, and then when it does launch into the world, we'll um, we'll point to it as well because we're fans and really excited that that's coming into the world. You did bring up something that I wanted to make sure we discuss because I'm obsessed with this topic with respect to a particular biomarker, yeah. um, and that is reference ranges. Yeah. And uh, you know the the thing that I personally have struggled with my whole life and only maybe recently sort of kind of have a handle on is I'm chronically anemic. Um, and my ferritin has for a lot of my life been as low as like six. Um, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago, a friend of mine who's a nutritionist sent me a bunch of research showing that the reference ranges for ferritin, uh, the, the standard issue ones are way off, especially for athletic people. Um, and that, you know, what is, you know, tw like 12 to 20 is the normal reference range for ferritin or something like that, but that athletes really need to have more like 70 to be able to perform. And so that was my first experience realizing that like, Hey, what's the deal with these reference ranges and where did they even come from? Um, I know that you don't agree with some of the sort of like industry standard reference ranges, or, or maybe I shouldn't assume that. Um, I guess my question is what's the deal with reference ranges where did they come from? And do they are reflect they valid? Do they reflect performance, or do they reflect yeah, and fake health? Yeah, do they reflect fake health, or do they reflect optimal health? And and how, how do we, like, what do we do as regular people? How do we deal yeah, with? Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad you're really asking this question because um, I get fired up about things. I start yelling into microphones, and then it, it can be perceived that I don't agree with reference ranges. I do for the purpose of disease identification, for sure. I don't for the purpose of people living their best life. That's where like it's it fails so hard. Um, it really does. And sometimes it's like a 10x multiple difference where where someone should be with respect to where the reference range ends. You know, like like homocysteine is a pretty good a quick example I can rock through here. Homocysteine at 9.47, you're at an increased risk of cardiovascular issues. At 10, on paper, you're considered hyper homocysteinemic. So hyper, lots of, homocysteinemic, homocysteine in the blood. So you're actually on paper considered in a state of hyper homocysteinemia at 10. And at 10, it also is an oxidative stress marker. And at 10, it's also a risk for hypertension. And then at 11.84, it becomes an all-cause mortality risk. And then at 15, it becomes a dementia risk and a deficiency marker for folate and B12. Reference ranges regularly go up to 18 and I've seen as high as 20. So you've flagged at a cardiovascular risk for 9.47. Hypertension, oxidative stress, hyperhomocysteinemia at 10. All cause risk at 11.84. Dementia, B9 and B12 deficiency at 15. And I'm still in the reference range. Like what are we, what are we talking about? Well, how, how is that a thing, right? So in terms of like disagreeing with reference ranges, a part of my heart does, to be honest, because I've known great men and women who like, the, maybe they're an accountant and uh, they're great parents, great partners. They coach the local team and they do a great job at their work. It's not their freaking job to keep up with the research on blood work. They trust it. They just do. And uh, it, it makes me emotional because that's a good person who just doesn't know that they just flagged for six risk factors which from one marker. And then no one addressed their patterns either. Like that, that kind of thing 
that has to stop. It just has to stop. So that that is like my kind of stance on reference ranges. You can't just have a bell curve approach where you take, and this is how reference ranges are built, by the way. You have 2.5% who are considered outliers over here. You have 2.5% who are considered outliers over here. Everyone else is normal, baby. We're just going to fall right into this thing. That's, that's, it's too large. It doesn't reflect optimal physiology. And it also just reflects population norms. So the sicker we get, the worse our reference ranges get. And this is progressively not making sense to me, even on a common sense level. So I think moving into the world of optimization is not something that has to be mandatory for people, but people should absolutely have the option to do it at a low barrier to entry way. And uh, in, in terms of optimization, we could use something like glucose, for example. Um, it's been demonstrated that for every one point above 85, you are at a 6% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes over the course of the next decade. But the reference range goes up to 100. So if you're at a 95, you actually flag green. So people just scroll by it. You're good. But you're at a 60% increased risk for the development of type 2 diabetes over the course of the next decade. Not to mention, at 95 is also when certain retinopathy and neuropathy issues begin. Their, their initial canary in the coal mine, that begins to take place. So like you ever come across somebody with diabetes and they just simply couldn't stop. So say they lost a toe or they lost a foot. That, that is that, that, that neuropathy taking place to where there is the degradation of tissue. And then there is retinopathy, which is the degradation of vision. Um, these early signs begin at actually 95. You're still in the reference range. So like when you're at a 6% increase for every single point above 85, also over 85 is an increase in um, cardiovascular risk factors as well. So that's actually both at 85. Both of those could not just blood sugar, but also cardiovascular values. And then lower is not better either because you actually see a U-shaped curve. And this is something that you'll see anywhere in biology. It's like the Goldilocks effect. If you have too little of something, it's not good. If you have the right amount of something, it's just right. And then if you have too much of something, it becomes not good again. Um, when you have these blood sugar values of less than 76, you actually see the same risk factors start to go back up. This weird thing, cardiovascular issues start going up, um, blood sugar issues, but in the other way, start going up, a hypoglycemic rather than hyperglycemic. Um, you see these things begin to take place and anybody in state of hypoglycemia is going to produce more catecholamines in order to compensate, to go back to that word, compensate to try and get them back in. But now you have the risk of all of these additional catecholamines um, that are only being leveraged to try and keep glucose in homeostasis. You then like when you start to actually see not just one, not just two, but then like 10, 20, 30 studies come out saying these things. It's like there is an optimal reference range that could absolutely be had here. It's very, very well control controlled studies representing this idea that we probably shouldn't be this low and we probably shouldn't be this high and that the people within this part of the bell curve seem to be the healthiest, not just within that reference range, but how that reference range also connects to LDL how that reference range connects to cholesterol, how that reference range connects to C-reactive protein and ESR. You start to see all of those things, and then you're starting to create this, this algorithmic strength towards formulating something that should be an optimal reference range that's not based upon population norms that puts people at risk for things they should never be at risk for. The, the example I think of here is that Kelly needs to donate blood, and I never have enough blood and if we had the same blood type, he would just pump it directly into my body. Baby, you take you just take you take a pint of blood <laughs> and flesh every day. Yeah. This is um, so romantic. I, it's, you have no idea. <laughs> um, one of the things that really struck me is you know the last time I had a DEXA scan, I didn't even fit on the table, and they were like, "Oh, we'll just flip your other side," you know. And I was like, "Wait a minute, like." part of my body doesn't even can't even be scanned. Like how accurate is the scan? And then you just eject my density. My eyes was so wide. Yeah, I like um, it. My, the wind's uh, a my wind. density was so, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> Lat spread. Yeah. And, um, my density was so far that the off the charts and standard deviations out that I was, the marker was actually in the writing, you know? And I was like, well, who, who are these normal people? Like I'm just a middle-aged guy who deadlifts a little bit. 
but my my bone density was so high that they it didn't even fit on the paper it fit over in the like oh, the yeah. margins of what was going on and it made me think what are I what that. you remember i was yeah. like what why is this over here off the page <laughs> and how do we then start to think about because it can't be the physician unless the physician she is working with elite athletes and seeing that is this one of the things that you're hinting at with some of the work you're doing and, and the that we're basically now starting to get a better snapshot of not just we'll call it out of fake health but really like this is what it looks like for an example for everyone oftentimes creatinine is elevated when people take creatine and work out hard and the, every physician is like don't take creatine because you you know this marker is high and i'm like well that's goes against what all the science is saying about taking creatine am i am i sort of right in this in We've, this by regard? the way i heard that exact conversation like 20 times recently because we had darren Candow on our oh, podcast yeah. and we're like pro creatine and i mean the amount of people who've said well it's great i mean i started taking creatine thanks to your podcast and then my doctor told me to stop taking it because my creatinine number was high and we're like ah. yeah that's just a, it is a beautiful representation that these are different disciplines. Um, because in no way, shape or like form that. would we ever want to disrespect doctors because they save lives every single day. Um, if, if you yep. break your arm, if you really have a disease, if you really need a medication, if you need surgery, if what the uh, critical importance to all layers of society are medical right. professionals. And in their defense, it is not their job to optimize performance. <laughs> And also no, in their defense, no. the people they see every day are not high performers. So it's it's not even necessarily no. like a or nor could they yeah. even understand your lifestyle. They don't have time to ask no. you to show up your aura ring <laughs> to talk about your sleep. I mean, that's it's almost like there's this type one error in the gatekeepers of sort of the, our traditional understanding of our basic physiology. And, and it's also molded that way for adherence. Because can you imagine, you know, um, you, you guys have been to Walmart. There's, there might be some night walking creatures in there. Imagine getting that person to get on a People real order. diet, like a real. Imagine the doctor saying, all right, we're going to control for energy balance. And then we're going to get one gram of protein in per pound of body weight. We should have food rotation and six to eight servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Like that, Or that person can take a medication and will actually extend their life a lot. You know, like that, that doctor is, is in a situation where he has minimal time to get to know somebody, the people who he's getting to know aren't high performers, and he has to provide the lowest barrier to entry for consistent adherence towards something that'll actually improve. And that is a medication. Yeah. So like that's, that's still absolutely needed. And we need to keep that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have this other lane of evidence-based high performance, evidence-based optimal health. H how is evidence-based optimal health not already in our face? Like that that should absolutely right. be there. That should not just be there. It should be everywhere. Um, people who choose to, to live optimally should have a true evidence-based track to follow that is objective. And I think in the same way the medical world uses blood to remain objective, the optimal health world should use blood to remain objective. We just look at it differently. We look at it differently and we prescribe different things um, for the purpose of someone who is who is ready to do all of those things. So I think in a big way, they're simply different lanes and you to the point where you can't even compare the two. It'll be a different subset of professionals who break the industry with it. Is there is there last question? Um, this is so great. I love this podcast. Yeah, we, we're probably going to have to have you back. <laughs> I would love many to come times. <laughs> Um, it seems like 18 plus one day and you can get a lot of this value, but 18 years old minus one day and we're like, it's too yeah. young. Have you found that there's a, a range where someone might be interested or as an apparent, I could be, Hey, I'm like, Hey, let's look at actually, is my child sleeping? Is she eating? Is she drinking water? Is this appropriate at some age? And, and where do we start to lose that some utility, especially, I guess, in the, the actionable behavior pieces? Yeah, I mean, there's such a difference between chronological age and biological age, because I've worked with a lot of athletes in my career. I've worked with a lot of um, young hockey players, young football players, young martial artists coming up. And um, you see it like right. some of them are kind of working with me just because they're really talented. And there's other ones that are very um, mature. 
they're, they're there, they're ready to work, they're ready to be organized, they're ready to be dialed in. They have um, a healthy relationship with training and a healthy relationship with food. The, the thing with the big, with the early age stuff is that it has to be so inclusive rather than exclusive. So like when I'm working with, um, with a young athlete, instead of saying you can't have any more Coke and Pepsi, I have to try and just give them a water goal. So I didn't actually take anything away verbally, but what I did was I included water so that hopefully some of that stuff naturally mm. fell out. Um, I can't, I don't want to say no more pizza pockets and no more toaster strudels and none of that. But what I can do is set some type of, okay, we're going to have a healthy source of protein at each meal. So we're going to have some eggs with breakfast and then kind of sugary cereals will just kind of naturally fall away. If eggs are on the menu, we're going to have uh, meat with lunch. Mom's always going to make a square dinner. Like you, there, that include that inclusive approach i could continue on with examples but i think you get the point rather than being exclusive is so important to foster a healthy relationship with food at a young age and and same with training they should absolutely like their sport and want to get better at it to where they will include mobility work include a recovery routine include training include practice include drill work the, these things should all be inclusive at that age so that you don't see the same old repetitive story of a kid being too much pressure applied upon them and them getting out of the sport forever. I just think blood work falls into that same lane because if you're 17 years old and 364 days, <laughs> it's still relevant for you. You know, <laughs> we don't have to wait until midnight for it to become relevant. Um, I think it, it a lot, much of it has to do with the emotional maturity of the the athlete and the way in which their mentors are currently treating the approach but at a young age you can get blood work and it is actionable yeah yeah i yeah, just feel and like i think the self drive the self-driven piece is really important and right? i, I mean they question, have to be interested in it on their own i asked that question because you and i know ten thousand parents who happen to have division one athletes <laughs> who are eight years old we know one million of them <laughs> well okay we 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 should just cut it off like the Dune way because then we know it's ended. Yeah. Even though we could just go on and on. Yeah, I mean, I had about five thousand nutrition specific questions I didn't even touch on. So you you hinted at. Usually we ask, "What are you excited about?" You hinted about this revolutionary athlete based called not, vitality. Vitality. We'll, we'll, we'll obviously we'll have links to that. Where can people follow you, become sort of biomarker performance curious? And I also want to highlight to everyone that you are your day job is a working coach and you actually coach people. And this is a tool that you've had to become an expert in. So you could have outcomes that, that matter yeah, to people's lives. Important. I think it's yeah. really important. You're not just like, this is all you do. You were like, if it doesn't work, you don't get paid. People don't win world championships. So tell us where to find you. That's, that's correct, man. I am in the trenches. Um, I, I am very upfront about letting people know that I am a coach first and an educator second. When we do podcasts like this and when I'm on social media, I'm talking about what I'm doing rather than just talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> those are those are two totally <laughs> different things, um, right. and uh, and you can see that reflected in uh, in my Instagram. My uh, my images are just screenshots of studies. They're not like super pretty anything. I uh, my my entire entire income and pressure and mission is um, making people the best versions of themselves. Actual world titles, actual world records. That's what I do, and uh, that's what this software has been completely built around. So if people want to follow me. Um, and they are biomarker curious. I do post a ton of that stuff, um, uh, keeping people up to date on the literature of what things impact other things in this world of performance enhancement. And that's on Instagram at Dan Garner Nutrition. Um, if you want access to the software, that will be at vitalityblueprint.com. And then if you want a full and complete suite of labs and to get the true professional athlete approach um, and uh, work with myself and Dr. Andy Galpin and the Rapid team, then uh, you can check out rapidhealthreport.com. Amazing. Awesome. Dan, thank you so Dan. much for being here. And we're extremely excited about all the things you and Andy are working on together. And um, we're just excited to see where it all goes. So. 
Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. This is a blast. And we do have to do it again. Yeah, Done. we do. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at thereadystate.com. And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You got it.